My name is Patty Bernard. I'm a member of the Nevada Women's History Project. Today is Thursday, September 20th, 2018. We are interviewing the Laura Zajic, whose career I have followed through the years ever since I discovered her in Reno, Nevada at the university. This interview is made possible by the generosity of the Roxy and Azad Joseph Foundation. Can you talk a little bit about your formative years, your, your parents, your early schooling, where you, how you wound up in Nevada? Well, I actually started out in Salem, Oregon. And at the age of seven, I heard another child play the piano and I was so ecstatic when I heard it and I thought, that's what I want to do. And I was seized by this obsession. I wanted to learn how to play the piano but we couldn't afford it. And my mother really didn't understand my need for it. And so uh, basically I was not allowed near a piano until I was a teenager. And by then it's too late if you're gonna learn how to play the piano. By the time I graduated from high school, I knew it was too late to be a musician. So I decided I was going to become a doctor and just pursue music as an avocation. And in the course of my studies in pre-med, I discovered that I actually had a crack at a career. I had enough natural talent as a musician and I had a voice. So um, I pursued it and that's how I ended up being a singer. So when I, was, uh, when I was 12, we moved to Las Vegas. And then when I was, um, uh, then for high school, we moved to South Lake Tahoe and I came to UNR because it was a cheap school. <laughs> because I knew I was going to have to support myself and it would be an inexpensive way. I figured if I did my first two years at UNR, then I could transfer and, and, and just work my way up. And it was during that period of time that I discovered that I had uh, the potential for a real operatic career and I took the chance and that's where I ended up. So that's how I came to Reno. And uh, who discovered you or realized that you had a talent for singing? Well, the first person who realized it was Rosemary Matthews. Um, um, and she, she was a student of Ted's and taught class voice. And then he went to Ted, uh, she went to Ted Puffer, and, uh, who was the, uh, the main professor there for singing. And he also ran an opera company, and I eventually ended up with him. And he's the one that basically molded and guided me. So she, in a sense, Rosemary Matthews discovered me, but Ted agreed and then they proceeded to develop me as an opera singer. I was a work study student in the music library and um, I listened to all the recordings and what was interesting about it was that I didn't realize that people didn't sing that way anymore. And uh, uh, they had stopped buying recordings after 1962. So I was listening to an old style of singing and my teacher had encouraged it so I didn't know any better. And, uh, and it wasn't until I arrived in New York as a student that I realized that I had been taught a, in a, a very uh, old fashioned type of vocal singing. Not, I'm not talking about um, modern sensibilities, but I'm talking about the actual vocal production itself, which really uh, was very good for me in the future of things because they were desperate for a Verdi mezzo because Fiorenza Casotto was not going to be around that much longer because she was getting up there in age. There was nobody to replace her. And so they were looking for a replacement for her eventually. And uh, so I was, it was my great fortune that I ran into Ted Puffer, who actually understood this old style of singing. So by the time I came on the scene in, in the opera world, um, I had something unusual. And you went then from UNR to New York? Yes. I went to Manhattan School of Music for three years. I already had a master's degree here, so um, uh, I enrolled in their special studies. I didn't want to get a doctorate because it was, um, I, did, I felt that most of the things that I would be required to learn were not really applicable to singing, and I had other interests. So, and I would rather read about things I was interested in. So um, music history does interest me, but not uh, at that point, not what they were going for. Which, so um, I went, I 
went for three years there. They later gave me a, an honorary doctorate, so I ended up with a doctorate anyway. Your doctor's that. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, but I don't expect anybody to call me that. It feels strange. <laughs> so. so you talked about um, a, an old-fashioned uh, education in, in voice. What was the difference between your voice and what was being accepted then in the opera world? Well, one of the things was the treatment of chest voice. It had become a disease, and people were saying, oh, don't, ch don't sing chest voice. It's very bad for you. And these, these big divas, you know, basically said that they never sang chest voice, but they did, you know. And so I thought, well, maybe it was a, they just were having a different label on it or something. But the more I delved into it, the more I realized that they used chest voice. And uh, there was no denying it. And uh, so I went ahead and used it. Because people said, oh, no, you're going to ruin your voice. You're going to ruin your voice singing with that much volume. And it wasn't that I was trying to sing loud. It's just that I was trained to sing with a lot of resonance, which is a very old school way of approaching singing. And, um, and it gave my voice a lot of presence. And um, so I, I pursued these things despite what people told me because my gut instinct said that I was on the right path. And it, uh, it stood well for me because the very people that were saying, no, 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 um, you know, they, they were the ones that said, see, I told you she was going to make it. It, it. Life is funny that way. <laughs> so... <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I ran into that a lot. A lot of people taking credit for my development. A lot of people were involved with my development, but not necessarily the ones that claim credit. So chest voice is uh, the lowest part of a woman's register that uh, some sing, many singers avoid. But if you want to sing the lowest notes, we speak in chest voice, but when we sing, you know, what people call falsetto, when men call falsetto, we call head voice. You know, when you talk like this, this is head voice. When you talk like this, this is chest voice. Oh, wow. And so, um, so many singers at that time were being taught that chest voice was bad for you. But it was terribly important for the old school Italian um, style. The problem, why, why it ran into problems was... The bel canto school, you mixed the voice, You're going from head to chest, you mixed it. And sometimes you emphasized a break, the castrati would emphasize the break for expressive devices. Um, it was an expressive device, so if you broke the voice, it was supposed to be emotional. And then there went, went a period where they were blending the two voices together. And so, but, but you still use chest voice, and you, the... The way they did it was by the time you got into chest voice, you didn't even know you'd gotten there because they did it without a break. But you were singing chest voice. So that's why people were saying, oh, I never use chest voice because they never did it with a break. You know, that, that would be like a yodel, like a yodel singing as a break. You're going back and forth from a chest to a head to a chest to a head. So when Verismo came along, which was after Bel Canto, what happened was it exaggerated the chest voice in terms of expressiveness and it brought the chest voice higher and higher and higher and uh, uh, and that began to do damage vocally and that's where the reputation came for chest voice being bad but if you don't take the chest voice higher than where your passaggio begins then you can sing as much chest voice as you want and if you're very careful and you know what you're doing you can occasionally sing above the break chest voice. Pop singers sing chest voice entirely. Kinesthetic empathy is the ability to know what the body is doing by the way something sounds. Um, let me give you an example. There was a, a very famous Russian choreographer who went totally blind and he was able to effectively continue to be a choreographer because he could tell when he put his ears to the floorboards exactly how they were landing on the floorboards, where their elbows were, where their torsos were, where their feet were, because, and he could feel it in his body because he had done it a, a thousand times himself and he had recognized that sound and he could connect it with the feeling in his body. So he could tell by the sound what they were doing. Uh, an example for a pianist would be they go to a concert 
and they can tell just by how it sounds that, oh, I think he slightly sprained his little pinky because it, that, 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 that is weak there. And it wasn't weak last week. They, 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 and it's only something that somebody who plays a piano would pick up. Now for a singer, it's the ability to mimic vowels without seeing the face or the lips. So you put a blind, the way you can test it is you put a blindfold on a singer and you say a vowel that they know like E. That's something everybody knows. So they go E, they copy you. And then you do something different. You go E and then you go E. And all you did was tighten up your upper lip and then you see what they do. Okay, the ones that have it in spades, what they do is they, they repeat it instantly. They can tell by how it sounds exactly what it's supposed to be. Then you have a second level, which they, it takes them a couple times to get it, but they eventually get it. And before they start, you see an almost subconscious flicker across their upper lip and they don't even realize they're doing it. It's sort of the body is already fleshing out what that sound is. And then you have the average person where it, they, they don't really get it, but they get closer and closer to it. And then you have people that it's like a shot in the dark. They, every time they do it, it's so different that there's no, there's no progression towards getting closer to the sound. Those people will never learn how to sing, no matter how blessed they are with other gifts. They, will, they don't have what it takes to learn a vocal technique. And whereas the people and the people that get it right away, actually, it's it's very difficult for them to learn how to sing because they do it all by ear. They can't analyze what they do because it's so natural. It's like perfect pitch. The ones that have the best chance of learning a vocal technique are the ones that it takes them a few tries before they get it because they have to analyze what they're doing before they get there but they have enough kinesthetic awareness that that combination gets them to where they need to be. And then you have the average person where they approximate it, but they don't get there, which means they'll eventually get there, but it's going to take them a while to do it. And the bottom line is for a singer, it doesn't matter how long it takes you to get there. It just matters that you do. So if someone takes a little bit longer in that part of their training, that's okay. As long as it's within, within the window of opportunity for them to have a career. So that, that is what kinesthetic empathy really is, is be able to empathize the, what the body is doing to produce that sound without seeing it. Which brings us then to, uh, you certainly have had a stellar singing career, which we'll talk about a little bit later, but you are also a teacher. Yes. And how did you move into this area? And I know that you have a... a three-week schooling or seminar? Yes, uh, it's, co it's called the Institute for Young Dramatic Voices, and uh, we specialize in dramatic and unusual voices, even for opera. Uh, uh, Wagner, Verdi, Strauss, um, for the lower voices, uh, the Russian rep and Monteverdi. And uh, so basically we specialize in hard-to-cast repertoire. So we, we're developing singers that the opera business is having difficulty finding people to fill for their casts. And this is uh, at the university? Uh, the university hosts us at this, at this time. And how do you find your students or your students find you? Well, we have a website. Uh, half of them come through the website. The other half come from referrals or they, uh, uh, we have talent scouts or the faculty, we ourselves hear a student that we think might be a good fit, and then uh, we have them pass you know, through our audition committee, and we have a group that decides whether they belong in the group or not. I read that you also had an association with a group in Washington? Yes, um, it's the Wagner Society of Washington, D.C., and they help fund our Wagner division. And uh, how does that... Uh, is it just funding, or, or is that also? Um, they, they, they fund, but they also uh, provide a concert in Washington, D.C. Um, we sing in, in various embassies and, and for um, 
small audiences um, where the students get an opportunity to, to try out their, their newfound talents. And you are so multifaceted, you are also a composer now. Yes. Can you talk yes. a little bit about that and how you got that interest? How I became involved with composing was a very interesting story because it was really through the Carmelite Monastery in Reno that this all got started. And the first thing that happened was uh, Sister Claire wanted to do a concert in commemoration of Teresa's, of Avila's uh, 500th anniversary. And I suggested, why don't we do something? And she thought that was a great idea. Now, I knew that Sister Claire had composed for a film and that she was a composer in her own right. And um, she asked me if I would compose for it. And so I said, sure. And uh, so I decided I would write a scene f from an opera uh, commemorating Trace of Avila. And, um, and I, I had an idea about a Carmelite monastery. And I guess what inspired the whole thing was I saw this uh, virtual choir and I thought, wouldn't this be an extraordinary way to unite Carmelites all over the world? Because they all live in these, these isolated monasteries and some of them don't travel, some of them are cloistered. And it would give them a chance to feel this unity and to be able to connect with each other if they had a virtual choir. And uh, so I, I dropped this idea with, with Claire. Now, I have to admit that Claire is the one who really did all the work on this. So she's the one that put it together. She's the one that did the footwork. She, she found the, the person who did the original virtual choir so that we could put it together technically. And um, she's the one that contacted all the monasteries and, and did all the footwork on it. And then we had this big celebration in San Jose. And it all came together in this concert and we made a recording of it. And, uh, and this is how it all got started. And it ended up getting reviewed <laughs> by the Huffington Post and by um, uh, various people, and it got legs, and so I ended up performing it in, in Madrid. Uh, so, um, and that's what got me started in composing. So now I'm composing several things. The problem is, is composing doesn't pay very well, and I have to make a living, so I'm having to really cherry pick, you know, my projects because there's no way I could do everything I'm interested in. And I know that a CD came from this. Um, yes. Yes, Living Water. Right. Living Water, and uh, with original pieces by Claire Sokol and me. Um, I think you'll enjoy it. Um, and and what um, challenges did you find in, in, in composing? Well, when I started, I didn't know anything about orchestration. So um, I went to each person that played that instrument that I wanted in there and asked them what the limits were. You know, where, where was the tessitura? What's the longest you can play in this area? Um, and, and that's how I found out how to write for each, each instrument. And then I wrote for each instrument, and that's how I did it because I didn't know anything about orchestration at that time. So uh, you are continuing this, although, as you said, it's, it's a limited time. Yes. What do you spend most of your time now uh, engaged in? Well, um, a lot. Um, I'm in the process of uh, putting together some ideas for a book on how, how music came to humans from an evolutionary perspective, which is really, which has intrigued me for a long time. And um, all the information is out there, it just hasn't been collated in, in from this perspective. And uh, I, I think I pretty much figured out how and when it came to human beings. And uh, um, it's, it's a rather fascinating, fascinating, um, discovery. It all started with a bird. Uh, I made friends with a scrub jay um, that would sit on my hand and sing to me. So I'd whistle back to it. 
didn't like my singing. When I would sing, he'd screech at me and run away. So, but when I whistled back and I was in perfect sync, he would stay. And if I got out of sync, he would leave. Well, I had to find out why. Well, it turns out that um, there's a naturally occurring hormone in humans called oxytocin, and it reaches its highest levels in humans just before a mother gives birth, just as she's starting to nurse, and when a group of human beings get together and make a supreme effort, but it has to be a supreme effort to synchronize themselves with sound or movement, which is basically singing and dancing. But it, has, it can't be just doing it for fun. It has to be a, a real attempt to synchronize. And, uh, and it turns out that birds, songbirds, have the same thing, except it's uh, mesotocin for females and vasotocin for males. So I was getting an oxytocin high, and Mort, who, which I named this bird, was getting a vasotocin high. And so this was one of the first, this is a very important aspect of music. If you want to uh, have a very important element of the higher levels of music, you have to be able to synchronize with other people. So um, it, 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 it created bonding for communities. So, so communities that perform together, um, they become closer. And it, it's, it's a bonding hormone is what it is. And it, it, it jump starts more complex forms of bonding. So that was one element. So the question that came to mind was, and of course this was one of five elements um, that make for human music at the highest level. And so when did that come in from an evolutionary point of view? Well, I got my first clue when I learned that Mongolian herders had discovered a time-honored manner to get a camel to accept its baby if she rejected her baby. Now, camels normally don't have painful births, but occasionally they do because the camel's too big or it's, it's, it's in the wrong position when it's born and a hoof gets caught or something. So um, the mother, because it's a pain, the, 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 the calf reminds her of the painful birth, she will reject the baby. So what they do is they hire a musician and the musician comes and hangs the, the vial, that two-stringed vial that they play. They hang it over the side of the camel, and they let the wind blow through it to create overtones. And if the camel responds, because a camel has the same overtones over a fundamental pitch, when they make a sound, they have those overtones. It might be different pitch, but it's the same overtones uh, for each pitch. Um, they then do it contrapuntal duet with a singer and the, the, the instrumentalist using those pitches, which is basically a Eastern pentatonic scale. And they, they, they play this duet, and if they can get the mother to cry, it will accept her baby. They'll let the baby nurse, okay, and then it'll increase more oxytocin, which will, um, then she'll bond the baby, then she'll accept the baby. And uh, tears, there's only three animals that have tears, and that's elephants, camels, and humans. And that's when um, uh, there's such a massive increase of oxytocin when the body's under a lot of stress. The body has to get rid of toxins, and it comes out as tears. So it's like, it's, it's like excruciating pain with, with pleasure all at once, and then it has to get rid of the toxins. And so I thought, aha! That's the key. That's the key. And the key was that, okay, between Homo erectus and modern humans, there was a massive increase in head size. And evolution was played out in the crucible of childbearing. Many, many mothers died and many offspring died because as the head expanded, um, the, the, the pelvis had to expand as well. And so the, the mothers that were least likely to reject their babies were the ones that got the highest oxytocin levels. And that's why humans have such high oxytocin levels. If we apply this to singing, um, the groups of people that get the highest oxytocin rises are the people that do it in groups. It's ensemble.
performance. Doing it by yourself doesn't do the same thing. It has to be with other people. And the more people there are and the more in sync they are, the higher the oxy oxytocin levels become. So it's when you're singing in a really good chorus. It's when you're singing with a chamber quartet. It's when you're with a really fine-tuned orchestra. And the and of course the more people there are the more work it takes to be truly synchronized so that's the that that's what that was the lure that really hooked me was i was getting some sort of a high in high school when i pl when i sang in the chorus or played in the band i played uh percussion in the band the last year so um that was the hook that got me involved with opera eventually um singing solo and grinding it out in lessons and doing um doing solo concerts it's not as rewarding as when you're with a group and if you want to get the oxytocin levels and with singers you get uh you know there's a there's a there's a uh dichotomy because um you've got the oxytocin reward and then then many singers go for the public award and so there's this constant struggle between the ensemble and getting the most attention, which a lot of singers fight for. And so finding that, <laughs> finding that place where you can really make art is not so easy. Not so easy. Well, you've had a marvelous career. What are some of the honors that you have? Oh, gosh. <laughs> main. That awards that you feel are are very prestigious for your the ability that you have had. When it comes to awards, um, there are many different things that you can get from an award. Um, so the Tchaikovsky Award, what I got from that from a practical point of view was it gave me a credit that I could take to a manager to say, see, I've accomplished this are you interested? And uh, I was able to move to the next level because of that. It was the first time I got mentioned in the New York Times and, and it, was, it was a way of getting my foot in the door. So it was really thanks to that competition that that happened because then that brought me to the attention of Betsy Crittenden who became my manager and, and uh, that's how it all began for me. And then there are, um, I remember when I entered the Met auditions, and uh, as I look back, the real value of them wasn't whether you won or not. The real value was that you got three things out of it. You got experience singing under pressure without being penalized because if, because if you audition for a company once and they don't like you, they don't take you for the second time. Whereas if you audition for a competition, it's understood that you're still a work in progress. So you get experience uh, performing under pressure. The third thing is that sometimes you get a little money. <laughs> and, and, and sometimes, once in a blue moon, it, it'll get your foot in the door. But the person who wins isn't necessarily the best person, always. Um, but what's important is 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 what what practical experience can you take from something like that and i've gotten many many awards but when i look at at it um i look at it as a way you know people that's that that's a way for the public to say thank you we appreciate what you did for us because when you give to the audience and the audience says thank you that's that means something and so when you get these awards it's it's a it's a way of people thanking you for everything that you gave because you do give a lot when you're up there and you are a servant you're you're uh you're a servant to the audience you're a servant to the music and uh and when you take a bow you know you're taking a bow with the audience in a way you're not you, you, you the, the whole point of a bow is submission it's not about you know look at me i'm this great singer it is the, the, the audience is, you're serving the audience. What keeps you going in the fast lane that okay. you are in? What really keeps me going are two things. Am I doing something meaningful? And I really need to feed my brain. 
I'm not happy unless I'm absorbing information. It's how I relax. Um, when I'm absorbing information or ruminating over something, I can spend half a day just thinking about something as I putter around and there, all these ideas come to my head and I think about things, I solve problems. To me, thinking is, is um, very relaxing. And then sometimes I don't even know where I go. You know, I just like to be nowhere. I enjoy that. If there's one historical person that I could be compared with uh, from a historical perspective, not in terms of his genius, but in terms of his personality, I would say I have a lot in common with Nikola Tesla. Um, he was a solitary creature. Um, he enjoyed it. Um, he loved birds. He thought about things all the time. He was he he would get these visions, not not mystical visions, but I'm talking about um, an intuitive vision of things, and then he would test it. So he was a true scientist in the sense that he would come up with an intuitive idea and then he would flesh it out, and um, you know he just thought about things all the time. His brain his brain never stopped because that's what fed him. That's that's what intrigued him. And, I, I, and I'm like that. I mean, it, it would be just like me to be sitting at a park bench feeding pigeons. But, you know, pigeons are amazing animals. You know, he, he uh, um, you know, somebody asked him, did you ever fall in love? And he said the, 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 mo the most important woman in his life was a white pigeon he discovered in a park. Now, it didn't mean he was having an affair with a pigeon. But what it meant was that there was something magical about this pigeon and he learned a lot from that pigeon. He learned some, you know, he, he said that there was something about the electromagnetosphere that this pigeon was showing him that he couldn't quite put his finger on. It was something intuitive. Turned out he was right. Turned out he was right. And, um, you know, I, I pick up these things and then I process them. And to me, that, that's what makes me happy. So that means that I guard my privacy very carefully because I'm a very, very private person. Not because I have anything to hide, but because I need to be alone a lot. I'm, I'm happiest when I'm alone. I do like to socialize. I don't do it very often. Um, and I'm perfectly capable of it. But most of the time I prefer to be alone because that's when I'm, that's, that I'm, I'm happy that way. What have you learned from your life experiences? I've learned that there is no one way of looking at things. That you can learn something from anybody. You can learn things from your worst enemy. You can learn things from, from uh, people that you think have nothing to offer the world. You can take somebody who, you know, is is looks like a vegetable, you know, is functioning at two months in a, in, a, in a handicapped body in a hospital somewhere. And you can learn compassion. You can get something from everything. Life has, life has a lot. And you've reached the height of success. Have you had failures that have taught you? Oh, everybody's had failures. Everybody's had failures. Um, uh, that's how you learn. That's how you learn. Uh, if we didn't have failures, there would be no learning process. The thing is, is do you improve? Do you get better? Do you learn from them? Or do you just repeat the same thing over and over again? That's... That's the secret. Nobody's right all the time. How would you like to be remembered? I think I would like to be remembered as somebody who made a difference in any capacity, whether it's the improvement of people's lives or, or just making somebody feel better the right way or inspiring somebody to do the right thing without being a holy roller about it. <laughs> and how
how do you feel that your music helps you? Music is a vehicle. It's, it's, a, it's a language. It's a beautiful gift that I believe that God gave us. Um, it, it's part of what makes us human. Um, maybe it's there in the afterlife. I don't know. I haven't been there. But I do know that right now that it, it's, a, it's a beautiful vehicle that, that creates a lot of good. It can also be used for a lot of bad. Uh, you look at these Hitler films and you see you know, how they used music to, they used that oxytocin to, for bad to, to make people feel united as a, as a nation to do all these horrendous things. Um, so there's a responsibility that goes with it. When you create this idea of bringing this thing that, that makes people feel good and, and, and want to do it, you got to make sure that you're using it for the right thing. Here's a sense of failure. Um, I remember when I was performing at the Met and uh, I had this mechanical cat on my shoulder and it had a tail that went and it had a head that went it had these glowing eyes. And the director said, don't hit the head too hard because we had um, we were trying to motivate hop my cat, hop my cat in, front, in uh, Czech. Uh, uh, and so we thought, oh, it's sticking its claws on my shoulder. So I would hit the head, the head would stop for a second, and then the head would continue going, right? Well, one day, in, as, uh, as the cat was doing it, I hit the head too hard, and the head fell off. And I didn't know what to do with the head. So I just shrugged my shoulders and threw it in the cauldron with the rest of the stuff I was mixing. And I had to finish this scene with a headless cat and the tail going, ear, ear. <laughs> and, um, and I thought, oh, oh my goodness, I'm going to be in trouble because he told me not to hit the head too hard. And it turned out that the, the audience, it was a dress rehearsal, the audience in the dress rehearsal thought it was part of the comic act. <laughs> because and they loved it, but unfortunately we couldn't repeat it. So I guess the I guess the 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 moral of that one is things may never go as you planned, but you know you might be redeemed anyway, but not because of anything you planned. <laughs> we are Nevada Women's History Project, all obviously, and so I'm wondering, what kind of a message would you have for? a young person just starting out and we obviously are thinking of females but it's male a young person what what advice would you have starting out them? in life or starting, starting out, out as in, a f in, 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 in life and and if they want to pursue a music career well if a young singer wants to pursue a singing career the first thing is to find a good voice teacher easier said than done but there was a very interesting, um, a very interesting uh, lesson I learned. I remember when I was talking with Leontine Price, and I had a friend who had everything except he wasn't learning a vocal technique, and he was with a really bad voice teacher. And I said, "Well, don't you think that as a friend I should tell him?" And she said, "Absolutely not." And I said, "Why?" She says, "If he can't tell, he's with the wrong teacher. He doesn't have what it takes." And I remember when my voice teacher told me it was time for me to go to, go to New York. And I said, well, um, who do I study with? And he says, oh, you'll find somebody. And I said, well, do you know anybody in New York? And he said, no. And he says, well, how am I going to tell if I'm with a good voice teacher? And he said, you'll know. And he was right. It is, that is part of the ability to be an opera singer. So if you really know what you're doing, I mean, if you, have that, if you have that innate ability to learn a vocal technique, to really learn one, you'll know you're in a bad situation. What I feel bad is these kids that go to these conservatories with, where they don't get to choose the teacher. They go because it's a famous conservatory, and they get the bottom of the barrel, and they're stuck with that teacher, or they have to leave the school. And that's, that's, that's really sad, and I hate to see that. So, um, you know, I would say to a young singer, audition your teachers before you go there. You know, try the teacher out, and then if that teacher happens to be at that school, that's where you go. Because the rest of it you can get in other ways. You can get private coaching. You can, 
Um, you can, uh, music theory classes, you can take those just about pretty much anywhere. But learning how to sing, that's not so easy to find. Getting good diction coaching from a, from a, uh, from a music coach, that's not so easy to find. Those are the things you have to be watching out for. And your general advice for anyone just starting out on a career? Well, I've said no more than I've said yes. And that's the secret. Um, singers, young singers are so eager to be recognized that they'll jump at any opportunity, not realizing it's one that's to their best advantage. They'll, their eyes will be bigger than their stomach and they'll think, well, I can sing that and I can sing that. But if you have a really good objective view of what you can and can't do, you're going to end up saying no more than you're going to say yes in the beginning. For any young person just starting out on any career in their... Learn your craft. A singer or anybody starting out in any profession should learn their craft. And that early discipline of really knowing what you're talking about, knowing, uh, knowing what you're supposed to know, and then be willing to learn from others who know more than you. Being open to new ideas. That's really important to be open to new ideas. Uh, many people, be, they become very closed or they think they know everything and there's so much to learn. I mean, you know what's amazing is you look at... I mean, what do we really know? I mean, if you even take the smartest people in the world and you look at what we really know, we can perceive only an infinitesimal fraction of the universe that exists. We, we can only perceive a certain spectrum of, of, of existence. So how can we know anything? I mean, we know sort of how this plane or whatever it is functions, but there's so much that we don't know. I mean, I'm amazed more at what we don't know than what we do know. That, to me, is more amazing. And then I had another thought. So what if you become one with the universe and then you know everything, all right? That could make life very boring if you had nothing to learn, <laughs> which means there's something even more important than learning. Thank you very much <laughs> for the time that you've given us. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you.